Hey, everybody. Welcome to Event Speak with me, Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential. We're an interview show, and we talk to professionals across the entire ecosystem of the event industry. Uh, eventspeak.com is where you're going to find us, obviously, because you're watching now. Um, and basically, tonight, we've got a very special episode uh, as uh, Lucas is a very old friend of mine. We go back quite a long time, and he's done all right for himself. Um, but before we get to that, and we will talk a little bit about the fact that here we are in Event Speak. You may remember us from before, but we're back now as a new um, social platform, a new digital hub for the entire event industry. It doesn't matter what part of it you come from, from brand marketing to music to movies, um, magicians, comedians. We don't care. If you're in the event business, you're in the production side of it, come here. You've got a voice. Um, and you can sign up for a free account at eventspeak.com. And you can watch this fantastic show with me. Big John. So with that being said, uh, without any further ado, um, Lucas Keller is the founder and CEO of LA's powerhouse music management company, Milk and Honey. With over 400 million records sold in his wheelhouse, um, I believe in 2018, seven different clients had hits all at the same time. Lucas manages songwriters, producers, um, major, these, the, the names are huge. Oak, Sir Nolan, David Hodges, uh, the Imagine Dragons songwriters, Demi Lovato songwriters, the list goes on. Um, so without uh, putting him on the spot any further than I already have, because he's waiting for me to introduce him, my good old friend, Lucas Keller, thanks for coming by Event Speak. Can you introduce me always, please? <laughs> we we'll get you some theme music, maybe like some good credence, and like I'll, I'll introduce you everywhere you go. <laughs> great, to talk, great, great to talk to you remotely. Um, yes, sir. In lieu of our dinner, which we'll have to have at some point here. No, nah, man, you know, with, as I mentioned, folks, Lucas and I have been friends a long time. Uh, I think literally 20 plus years. We're both Midwest guys. Um, and we've been trying to find time. And that's not an easy thing for two busy guys. So, I think and then. Might be 20 years. I think you could be right about that. Yeah, because, well, dude, if I remember correctly, I was still playing in Sweater Girl. And yeah. you booked us when you were putting shows together at Club Phenomenon. And yeah. I want to say you were Before Illinois. You were like 17, maybe I something was, like that. I was nine. I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I was nine. I remember I you seven. had a, I remember you had a show shortly, like a few months after we played there, you had good Charlotte play and the floor collapsed. Do you remember? I that? had this great conversation by the way, cause I was doing, I've become really good friends with the Madden brothers and, uh, and we yeah. were, we were, I was doing some business with them in, in their company, uh, MDVN. And I said, uh, said, do you guys remember? And I like brought that up and they totally remembered it because how would you ever, ever, <laughs> how do you ever, ever forget? forget? Oh, when all of our fans were, almost was, died. It yeah. A, it was such a kind of like long journey back into both of our lives. But, uh, but I remember mentioning that randomly at a dinner. It was pretty funny. I was like, do you remember <laughs> this time in Freeport, Illinois? It was a little awkward. It was funny. <laughs> yeah. When the floor of the uh, parking garage. Felt, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I remember, um, you telling me that, and then, um, you know, I, I was friendly with the Madden brothers and all those guys, um, you know, Billy and Paul, back in the day when Sweat Girl was still doing a war tour. Um, and, and for a better group of dudes, I don't think you could find, man. And, you know, just down to earth and super supportive of a lot of the younger bands like myself and Sweat Girl at the time. Uh, and I saw them a few months after that happened. And like, dude, we we're playing the show out in the Burbs of Illinois and the freaking floor collapsed i was like oh yeah that was for my guy <laughs> but um anyways lucas so you know here we are i mean um it's it's covid19 reality um the hot button questions that everyone's talking about of course is you know how is it affecting you how is it affecting um milk and honey how is it affecting your industry and and you know how are you guys kind of pivoting and and managing through it now correct me if i'm wrong i mean the majority of your business your core business you know are in songs so not as heavily in the the, the live side of it but i know that the live live concerts and all that are, are a big part of your business so tell me what that's like well, I think we all feel like we're riding around in a golf cart that has a governor on it, right? <laughs> it's moving a lot slower, and, you know, we all want to go faster, and we're just stuck at, you know, 10 miles an hour. Um, you know, I'd say about 25% of my business is uh, artists, and 75% of it is songwriters and producers and mixers. And so, uh, for a lot of reasons, my goal was always to have a really diverse business, and uh, and so we're we're pretty largely hedged in the song business. 
that, you know, the, the old line is always that songwriters make money in their sleep. You go to sleep at night and your songs play around the world and you wake up in the morning. And so, um, you know, at first streaming for the first couple of weeks of the coronavirus scare, um, streaming went down a little bit. And the statistic is actually streaming on music, streaming on, on streaming video on demand has went up 85% in the first four weeks. So everyone's at home watching Netflix, but they're watching the news and people are talking and there's not a lot of consuming music. And then after a couple of weeks, it went back up again. And so streaming music is really strong. Um, FM radio is really strong, actually. A lot of people listening, which people don't really believe because people aren't in their cars. Um, but what's going to really hurt my business is, um, and, and won't, <laughs> I'll get back to this, but won't hurt us in the way that um, the touring business and, 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 you know, big, you know, kind of live touring artists got hurt. Um, but because advertisers are not spending money, um, that's going to hurt us a lot. They're not, you know, you know, songs are not going into TV commercials, advertisers are not spending money at radio. Um, so if you're the, you know, car dealership in Lincoln, Nebraska, you're probably not, you know, paying for the ads on the local FM station. Yeah. If, you're the, if you're the cheesecake factory and you can't afford, if you're calling Westfield malls and saying, Hey, we can't pay our rent. Um, you're not paying ASCAP or BMI for your royalties uh, on, on the music. So, yeah. um, so it's, so it's domino it's, effect. Domino effect. So all the, the, um, you know, performing rights organizations, um, ASCAP and BMI being the big ones that, you know, which are the companies that monetize all of the airplay. So you hear a song at a mall, you hear a song, you know, at a restaurant, you hear a song on FM radio, um, all of that stuff is, is, is collected by these societies. Um, and uh, and we're going to see a thirty to forty percent dip in that in the coming months, uh, which is which is going to affect everyone. I think for milk and honey, we represent about sixty clients, um, and and we were well set up and you know kind of had a war chest to deal with this, where you know we're not um, you know one or two or three or four clients that uh, when this happens we're really in trouble. So so we're thankful for that, but. Uh, you know, we lost a ton of money in the first two, three weeks because all of our artists came off the road and all the summer festivals and shows in Ibiza. And, you know, most of our live stuff, to be clear, is electronic music. So all the stuff in Europe, all the U.S. stuff, Vegas stuff, all of that went away. And most of it, um, you know, there's all this talk about how fall is still um, in play, but it's not. Most of that stuff is gone uh, for us. So... Whereas we lost a lot of money on that, like on a very human level, I'm just super grateful because, you know, our business is still intact and we're 17 going on, you know, closely approaching 20 employees, um, no salary reductions, no layoffs, um, you know, very, very grateful for that. So uh, my main priority was making sure that our people were taken care of and, um, so yeah, you know, in these times you realize like some companies keep cash around and some, you know, some of these companies are so leveraged um, that you really realize now that there's big, big companies that are in a lot of trouble because they just weren't set up for something like this to happen. And who really thought this was going to happen anyway, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've said it a, a thousand times. Uh, you just, you don't consider a pandemic when you're looking at your year. Um, I mean, did you read the story about Wimbledon about the pandemic insurance? No, what's what is, it, what is the Wimbledon for, pandemic insurance? For 15 years, Wimbledon has been paying for pandemic insurance. They paid something like it's like 18 or 20 million dollars in pandemic insurance over you know a decade and a half. And you know, it's funny at some point, I'm surprised someone in the boardroom didn't say, like, guys, what are we paying for this? Bill? Like, can we cut this on the line item? But they got some crazy like nine figure check um, in, on, on their claim. Very I don't serious. mean to laugh. That's just extraordinary. Like it's extraordinary. You should go read about it. I got, I got to write this it's, down. I because write this it's the real thing. What's interesting is all the talk with promoters is how, you know, this is a force majeure item. Um, you know, none of the insurance companies cover it because after SARS happened, there was a whole clause about infectious disease that was added into these insurance riders. And so, you know, all the promoters are fine because this isn't really covered. Um, but from, from, from what I gather, but, um, you know, it's interesting that certain people actually held pandemic insurance and you start to think maybe it was irresponsible for the major promoters to not have it. But again, it's such an insane thought 
that who would say, well, we should really pay for that. By the way, something that can completely cripple their business the way that it has. Um, nobody really thought, oh, we should have that, you know? Except for Wimbledon, evidently, and it paid <laughs> off big for them. That's, wow, dude, that's, that's a great, great story. And I mean, I think that it's just goes to show, it's just so unpredictable. I mean, if my nearly 20 years between the entertainment and, you know, the experiential marketing world and, I've, I've never seen anything close to it. Um, I mean, even in 2008, 2009, uh, H1N1, like we all kept working. Um, and you know, now we're in a scenario where the entire globe is being massively impacted by it. And of course, for folks like us and our shared industries, um, specifically singled out where, you know, people in the event industry are, are really hurting. Um, what would your advice be to, um, not only the young artists out there that are kind of scratching their heads thinking like, well, what do we do now? Cause obviously the, you know, everybody's on Zoom, everyone's streaming everything. I mean, there's the, people are rethinking it and some folks are getting really creative. Um, do you see pros and cons to, uh, to the uh, being completely uh, set up on the digital side of it and not being able to tour? Uh, and do you also, would you say you have advice for those young artists as far as uh, what should they be at least thinking about right now? Well, I think it's a tough time to be everyone, right? Like young artists uh, don't have the capital to keep things going through all of this. At the same time, big artists are all pretty extended and have big overhead and, you know, people that were set up to go on tour and, you know, the young artist looks at the successful artist and says, well, geez, you made millions of dollars and so you're going to be just fine, but they don't really realize that it's like the more you make, sometimes the more your overhead, you know, increases sure. usually is. So, um, you know, sometimes the more successful artist is in a, is in a worse place. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, uh, I could just speak in terms of like, you know, being in the business and being as a manager, like I, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of companies are going to really focus on being more diverse after this and having different revenue streams. Um, I think artists will do the same. Um, artists focus so much on, so much of their livelihood is on, um, is on going on the road. And a lot of the artists that I've met over the years uh, are frustrated by that. Um, a lot of them that tour for a long time, they really wish that they, um, you know, could, be in the studio and monetize their music and make money off of sync licenses and brand deals and things that don't involve necessarily going out on the road. I think if there's ever a time for live streaming to get fully fleshed out and become a real business, because it was always kind of the schlocky business that it was like, yeah, if I, you met a guy that ran a live stream company, it was like, okay, cool. You know, <laughs> at, at, at the I'll top, keep the lights on if you will. At the top 20 tentpole festivals in the world. Like, I mean, look in the electronic world, you know, being on the ultra live stream or being on the Tomorrowland live stream is a really big deal. Being on the Coachella live stream is a big deal. But I mean, you know, outside of the top 15, 20 festivals, it's kind of whatever. I think it's going to become a real business now. And, um, and I, and I think that, you know, for artists, it's, it's about figuring out, you know, how to, how to find the kind of glass half full, you know, and, and figure out, you know, how do you take this time kind of in history and, you know, and, and just make great music and, and put out great art and realize that it's like most of, I mean, I'd say at the major labels, 75% of releases are still coming out from the research I've done and talking to all kinds of people. 25% of releases are getting pushed. I think if you're John Legend or Lady Gaga, you feel like there's so much of kind of existing in the real world and, and the amount of setup that goes into those albums, whether it's late night or doing promo or it's, you know, there's things that, you just feel like doing a digital release cheapens things. But I, you know, aside from that, I'm seeing 75% of the releases are still coming out. And, and one of the concerns is that there's like a bottleneck, right? There's, you know, so many live streams going on and there's so much coming out digitally. And it's kind of like, is there's just so much to choose from, you know, um, which is, which is, which, which is, which causes its own problems. Um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, so, so I, I think for artists, like it's about trying to find kind of the good in the whole thing um, and just embracing that it's like where we're going in the next 20, 30 years is all digital anyway. So it's going to have to be figured out. And if people are concerned about, well, I can't exist in the real world. It's like, well, 
you know, most of your releases wouldn't, you know, uh, beyond the actual tour dates, there wouldn't be much to do in the real world anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm no, I get it. I, I totally get it. So much of it is digital and, um, you know, but it, it's hard. It's hard to replace the amount of money on the touring side. And, um, Makes me think about a lot of other things. You know, I think we're headed into a, a few years of recession. I think that artists, and, and I actually blame the artists for this. I don't blame Live Nation and Ticketmaster and AEG and all these people. Artists have been driving up these ticket prices for so long. And the, the reason my business will be intact is that for for you to pay $10 a month, all you can eat music on, on Spotify or Apple Music, nobody's canceling that, right? Because you don't get billed $120 at a time. You get billed $10 a month, and and people need art in hard times, and, and it's just the barrier of entry to get all you can eat music is so so cheap now that it's like, it's, it's, it's for the consumer, it's a wonderful experience. I go to buy, like, if, if I was going to go buy two tickets at the Hollywood Bowl or the Greek or, like, you know, like a, 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 a prominent venue in L.A., and nice tickets, it could cost me six, $700 for two tickets. Like, like, ticket prices have gotten so insane, and people have feasted on touring in a way that it's, like, it's, it's out of control. And I think at the end of this, people are going to realize in America, like, mm, maybe we didn't save that much money. Maybe we're not going to go run out and blow tickets on, you know, or blow money on, on concert tickets. And, um, and, and, I, and I think it could be really hard for the, for the concert business to come back. I think it could take a couple of business, a couple of years to really uh, to, to, to bounce back from a financial and economic perspective. And then of course the idea of people standing next to each other and all that, which is, but I'm not even going to get into that, but it's like, I think no, it's, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's really going to take a long uh, while for that to, uh, to bounce back because I think people, the difference between your $10 for your Spotify and someone saying hundreds of dollars for concert tickets, I think people are going to be a little more discretionary, you know? And they're not going to have a choice because let's face it. I mean, a lot, everybody's hurting right now. What is it, unemployment? Like 26 million people right now in unemployment. It's, 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 and you're absolutely right. I feel like the reverberations of this will be coming far longer than I think uh, we realize because, yeah. you know, people are taught, I mean, there, there are people that feel it's extreme. Like, Oh, it'll never be like the way it was. Well, I think there's going to be uh, a familiar version of the way it was. I mean, there, you know, post COVID-19 America and in general is going to be a very different place. Um, and I feel like every passing day and, and I understand why, and I'm not even having that conversation, but every passing day now is it's, it's just hurting more and more as the, economy just falls apart um so there's going to be obviously that much more of a strain on trying to restart it and now you you look at you know um you look at you know we were talking with kevin lyman just recently and, and hearing what um hearing what the cost promoters hearing what people that are event plan what they're talking about yes next year hopefully and even then you're going to probably be doing smaller smaller events for a few hundred people and it's going to take time to get to those festivals again and that's not even considering people with the ptsd aspect of this um that i think is a really important conversation to have. i don't know if you're familiar with this lucas but kevin lyman is producing and all of his students at usc as he's professor lyman now uh, is producing the um 320 festival uh 320 festival.com yeah, down at uh, down by staples i'm very familiar with it. one yeah. of my, my interns uh has told me all about it yeah i mean just amazing so folks out there you, you guys heard me talking about on the show all week um it's May 8th through the 10th, uh, it's it's online completely, of course. Uh, there's educational panels. There's over 43 different nonprofits involved. There's performances. Um, it's this massive thing. Uh, and it all, you know, like basically all the proceeds after cost are going to go to uh, supporting mental health and mental health for everybody, you know, not just everybody, people like in the frontline workers too and uh, the people that are down there, you know, in the relief efforts. Uh, I mean, I feel like it's a really in important thing. And for more information on that out there, that's uh, 320festival.com. All right, Lucas, let me ask you this, man, um, because we've, we've, we've had a pretty good look. And, and thank you for opening up uh, your world a little bit to us because I think it's something that all of us, you know, it's, it's an uncertain time. And everybody, you know, some people, I feel like um, we have an idea of what's coming. But really, if you and I were talking two months ago, we probably wouldn't have thought we were sitting here right now, right? And okay. it just, it just, and I, but I also think there's hope in that equation because on that same perspective, at some point, aspects of this are going to go back and it'll go back fast. And I feel like, 
it's going to be um, reinvention. And, you know, that's honestly part of what brought Event Speak to life. And, you know, my partners and I uh, with Beyond and Evolve and our partners and, and James and Nebula Agency were like, listen, we have to rethink our core business. Like we can't have all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. You know, and the event business has been booming for years. And, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And Event Speak then came about and, and here I am talking to you, you know, figuring like, hey, how do we give people a voice? How do we give them something that everyone relates to, especially even our younger millennial friends? And well, a social platform is that. And uh, giving them the opportunity to hear people like yourself um, talk. So let's have a little fun. So Lucas, I, I know like both of us, we both played music at one point in our lives. Um, in fact, uh, you are a guitar player, and you collect some guitars, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many do you got? 34, 35? 35. <laughs> yeah, it's out of hand. Well, you yeah. just bought a new house, so you needed yeah. an extra room just for your guitars, I'm guessing. Yeah. My, a lot of the guitars are at the office, actually. Oh, really? Like you keep my dramas. Yeah. Okay. Go, um, go, go, go rob 6100 Wilshire. <laughs> Wanna, you, got, you have his blessing. Good luck. So, what what is your what is your pride possession of all your axes? Uh, I just ordered a Gretsch White Falcon, and that's wow. um, I love these like Gretsch semi hollow body guitars, like in just uh, like these kind of just great jazz guitars. Um, and then I, I get some other stupid shit. Like I have a uh, Fender Mustang that I love, and I have a uh, uh, I have a, a, a basically a replica of the Eddie Van Halen Frankenstein. The Frankenstein, I saw yeah. that man. That's such a I love Van Halen. Thing. Yeah, I love that thing. So. Is that is that is that a Kramer guitar? Yeah, yeah. Wow, very very rare. Uh, sorry, guys, we're, we're us gearheads geeking out a little. Basically, bit. Basically, they're Kramers and then they get modified. Is what they are. Yeah. Okay. All right. And all right. Strikers and then they modify them. And the, the truth is, of all my guitars, it plays like shit, but it looks incredible. But it looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a. Um, I used to have, it was a BC Rich Mockingbird, but one of the American made ones oh, yeah. in New Jersey, strung through the neck with that nice sustain. I always, it was the, the slash from the, the, the GNR video from Terminator 2, You Could Be Mine. It was the sure. replica of that. But, oh man, the guitar was just, it was heavy and awkward, but it sounded so good. And <laughs> you know, um, we, were, we were chatting a little before uh, we, we started filming guys. And Lucas, you just recently ran across some artifacts that I believe relate oh, yeah. to me. Um, oh, yeah. Were they uh, some some old CDs that you ran across? Because uh, <laughs> I still can't believe that you have these things, man. Small boxes. Here we go. So old we Sweater Girl CDs. Wow. Old sweater Girl. And then we got uh, 10 Times a Day Sweater Girl. And there we go. The, you have the 2002 Warped Tour comp. Oh, my God. That's – that's to digitize those, you know? That is crazy. Um, Lucas and I met guys – I mean, like I said, we were – he was in his late teens. I was in my twenties. I was playing in a, a pop punk band called Sweater Girl. Um, and Lucas, I'll tell you, you might not know this, but when we did that record with Ryan Green, uh, who did all the no effects stuff and a lot of stuff, all you folks out there have heard. Um, you had you had instant messaged me on AOL, and you're like, "How do I do a record with Ryan Green?" And I'm like, "Wow, that's a really good idea. How do I do a record with Ryan Green?" And I remember I started digging around and ended up through uh, Joey from Lagwagon getting linked up with Ryan and ended up doing that record. So you actually kind of had a non-direct like kind really? of shove. Uh, yeah. No, it, it was, and I remember, and you were as picky as you are uh, when it comes down to what you like. I remember at that time you really liked it. So I was really stoked. That's dude, that's, uh, that's a jaunt down memory lane. And you I mean, know, it's, he, he made like the greatest sounding drums of all time. Oh dude, they're just like cannons. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I think he, um, I haven't talked to Ryan in a long time, but he, uh, he's, he's doing, he's got like a whole line of, you know, Ryan Green drums. Like he just. I think I went right from being a Ryan Green fan to becoming a Mutt Lang fan. Like as my kind of world <laughs> opened up, and like the, the the truth is, there's not a lot of like. I mean, I guess one uses reverb and one doesn't. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, but but there's like, but there's but there's but they're like I, there's a there's a common theme in that it all sounds like it's made for arenas, you know. <laughs> all right, what are you listening to these days? Man, what am I listening to? Top, uh, top three, because you could probably tell me 25 things if I know you. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, there's a, I mean, I love all the new stuff 1975 is putting out. Uh, there's a band called Laney that I'm a huge fan of that a really good friend of mine manages that's, uh, that's on Interscope. Uh, I'm a huge fan of um, 
really been going back and just digging into classic jazz records, you know, and that I've, that I've been, been spending a lot of time with. Honestly, if you sit and listen to pop records all day, you can't listen to Selena Gomez and Demi Lovato. <laughs> I would not you're, think you could. Before you're going home and listening to jazz records. So, um, so yeah, you know, I mean, the, one of the really interesting things about what I do is that I work in every genre, you know? So, I mean, we make country records, pop records, R&B records, rap records, tons of electronic records. Our, our core thing is pop. Um, there's you know, lots of alternative stuff too. Um, there's really no genre we're not making records in. And so um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the music I get to listen to kind of satisfies uh, that whole thing and kind of what I'm, what I'm a fan of, you know, you get a little bit of it all. What'd you a say? Little, a little bit of it all, you know, um, which is really, really great. So, so uh, the, the struggle with tonight was there were several things I wanted to do, but I wasn't able to uh, before the interview. One of which was I actually debated uh, having a cigar with you right now, but I, of course. you know, this is, this is my, my bedroom as well. So I didn't want to like be smelling cigars all night long. Uh, but as you know, we'll, we'll uh, smoke when you come visit, well, that's what I figured is I'll just, I'll have to just save it for when we have our next visit. Uh, you know, on that note, um, what is your favorite cigar yeah. and your favorite whiskey? Not necessarily in that order. Um, I think that, uh, so, okay, so I'll start with the, the whiskey. So um, I think one of the things I've really fallen in love with, and I can't drink it as much anymore because um, just because acid reflux, but um, there's an area of Scotland. So let's just go to Scotch. There's an area of Scotland just called the Islay region. And it's things like Laphroaig, Lagavulin, uh, Bruce Laddick, um, things that are really smoky, things that are basically when they, um, not to turn this whole conversation into how whiskey and scotch is made, but where they basically burn the peat and they create this, this whiskey that basically uh, tastes like a campfire. So it's just called peated scotch. Um, I've, I've probably done more damage to my kidneys drinking peat and scotch. <laughs> um, so there's a whiskey called Octomore that's made by a, um, uh, distillery called Bruce Laddick and it's my favorite favorite stuff in the world it's the highest I think it's 300 300 this bottle I have is 360 uh, parts per million of, of peat so it's it's basically the smokiest scotch in the world um, and that's <laughs> my and that's my that's my favorite I'm kind of getting into American bourbons lately and drinking a lot of the pappy stuff and uh, but 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 scotch is really is really my thing on cigars it is a toss-up between um, uh, between any type of Cohiba Esplendido and then a Hoyo de Monterey Epicure uh, Especial number two, um, and with any great Cuban cigar, stuff that's aged. So anything kind of between 10 and 16 years old, to me, is like the, the sweet <laughs> for cigars. So. I expected a detailed answer. Sorry, uh, I know. No, no less. Like, oh, no, that's great. That's great, man. Uh, you know, I... Yeah, that's my favorite, so that's the answer. Yeah. You know, I, I do enjoy I do enjoy some good whiskey. I'm an Irish whiskey guy. I I, I love it. And um, and there's there's this there's a particular label called Middleton uh, that oh, yeah. is just phenomenal. Uh, I was out of Park City this last year, um, and there was this Irish pub that was right across the street from where um, our whole activation was set up. And you know, I was waiting for the activation to get done. I was you know just walk across the street and go belly up to the bar and try every kind of Irish whiskey they had under the roof. It was fantastic. Um, Lucas, I really I can't tell my, you. My favorite Irish whiskey, I have a bottle of Red Breast 21. Do you know that stuff? Red oh, Breast? Oh, yeah, dude. Great I'm stuff. Red Breast 20, I, I think I have some Red Breast 12 in the, uh, in the house. 21. Great Ooh. stuff. Great stuff. Good, good stuff. Now, final question. And I, I, this was the other thing I was going to do that I couldn't pull off for you because we don't have this implemented in the show yet but i wanted to like get a always pick like a song that i could play over the intro of what a, who i'm introducing and you know i couldn't imagine what band i would choose to have you know for an intro for lucas keller and then it dawned on me it has to be ccr it has to be credence clearwater and then i thought lucas you're not a fan of ccr are you hate him <laughs> I, 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 you, how do you, how do you hate CCR, man? Like it's like it's like as American as apple pie. I was hoping that my intro music would just be "Bad Company" by Bad Company. 
<laughs> Why do artists not use their names? As long as I don't understand. You know, hey guys, if you're watching this, there I love you know Lucas is a busy guy. I'm a busy guy, but there'll be times that I'll just you know I'll be listening to CCR and working during the day, and I'll go up and I'll take a voice message of it and i'll send it to his facebook messenger just just to mess with him and he's like trash military rock <laughs> yeah i just don't i just don't like 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 uh like bad moon rising is just like a bad song i don't know yeah. Oh, Lucas. We're going to have to <laughs> agree to disagree. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Lucas Kelly. Lucas, thank you so much for coming and sitting. I mean, dude, I, I sincerely appreciate it. It's really good yeah, of course. to see you again. Uh, we need to do that Italian feast at your new Sukasa. We'll so, do it. The moment um, it's done, we'll get together. I love it. Nah, dude, for sure. And uh, my very best to, to mom and your family and company and everybody back in Milwaukee and to everything you're doing. I sincerely wish you the best. Uh, Lucas Keller, everybody, from Milk and Honey. Um, milkhoneyla.com and uh, I would say to all you young artists, out there, young artists out there that want to know how a guy like Lucas finds you is it's exactly that. If you're doing what you should be doing and you got something undeniable he likely will find you and not the other way around. Uh, this is Event Speak with me, Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential. You can find us on the web at www.eventspeak.com Until next time, please take care of yourselves and each other.